Welcome to this edition of Crops TV, where we'll be talking about forage production and management. My name is Aaron Soigling. I'm an extension field agronomist in Southwest Iowa. And with me today is my counterpart, Rebecca Vitito. Yep, and I'm the extension field agronomist over in East Central Iowa. And this is just showing a, a map of the different areas that Aaron and I cover. So I cover that region eight area on the map and Aaron covers the region 10 area. And we're happy to answer any questions that you might have. So I think in keeping with that theme today, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about forage production uh, and management. Obviously, Iowa is very diverse, as you can see in the map that we showed earlier from north to south. Um, so I will talk a little bit about production in southern Iowa. And uh, there's some key differences, maybe if you're in the northern part of the state, and we'll try to address those as well. So kind of our agenda for today, uh, we want to talk about proper forage management and uh, how important uh, this is and successful in terms of longevity for pastures as well as hay fields. And sometimes we use those terms interchangeably here in Iowa. Uh, a typical uh, management system in Southern Iowa is to hay uh, our first cutting. And so what we'll do is we'll go out and we'll actually take a cutting of hay off of a pasture. And so if you find yourself in that position, uh, there are some management tactics that you are going to want to pay special attention to, as opposed to simply uh, using it for forage production. And so there's a blend related to that in particular. So starting off, uh, let's look a little bit about what forage stands are uh, and what we want and where are we starting. And so one of the key factors with that is, do I have the right species in terms of selection? Have I chosen the right species, especially maybe if I'm in a renovation situation, which we'll talk about uh, a little bit, uh, but the other may be, what species do I currently have in my pasture? And so that's gonna be something that's very important um, going forward. So I kind of break this down. Uh, so when we look at forage types in Iowa, this will vary a little bit in terms of your geography in the state. If you're in the northern part of Iowa, let's just use I-80 for an example, or maybe Highway 30. Um, cool season uh, forages in the northern part of the state um, are going to be a great opportunity for you, um, as well as production as well. So as we move south in Iowa, cool season forages, typically in that July to August timeframe go into a dormant stage. So our productivity is a lot less. So we have to kind of take that into consideration uh, in a pasture in terms of our stocking density, whether we may or may not need to supplement cows if that's uh, our production system or what we can expect in terms of the number of cuttings that we have. So we also talk a little bit about warm season grasses. Um, Iowa's unique in that that uh, can be a difficult um, management tactic. I have seen it used successfully in rotational grazing systems in Iowa, uh, but we need to kind of think about what type of system that we want. And so an example of a warm season grass uh, would be something like switchgrass, Indian grass, uh, small blue stem, big blue stem. Uh, those would be also great opportunities. And then we also have to talk about sod forming grasses and bunch type grasses. And so these come into play, particularly if we have erosion concerns uh, related to the topography that we have. So for all practical purposes, uh, I'll cut to the chase. One of the predominantly sod forming grasses in Iowa is smooth brome grass. And so you'll oftentimes uh, hear me talk about the benefits of smooth brome grass, particularly in pastures that have sloping topography to prevent soil erosion. There's other very nice cool season grasses. Orchard grass is an example of a bunch type grass, um, which has very good productivity early in the season, uh, but at the end of the season, it tends to trail off and can be a problem in terms of uh, erosion in particular. Another big bunch grass that we deal with in the southern portion of the state, and I've seen it actually in parts of northern Iowa, is tall fescue. And so uh, that's also a grass that can be something that's highly beneficial. And I'll talk specifically about some tall fescue traits uh, here in a minute. So legumes, uh, these are also something that can be very, very important in a pasture. Um, and so we'll have to address some management tactics if we have legumes or if we're interseeding. And so we'll talk some fertility uh, on how we wanna look at that. Uh, legumes are extremely beneficial 
uh, for us in a grass pasture to add to productivity, uh, as well as diversity and drought management in particular. Uh, and then the other class of uh, species we might consider are brassicas. Um, typically, these are maybe used in a cover crop type system. So how, how do you make that determination? Um, what, what grasses do I use? Do I have a holistic approach? Uh, I will say most of pastures in Iowa are simply cool season grasses. And the reason for that is durability, uh, cost of establishment, um, and the ability to use that forage at a given time of year. So what we're looking at here is a growth curve. Um, so you can see by the blue line, this is our cool season grasses. So we get really good productivity early in the spring. Uh, if you visit with most cow-calf producers, what they'll tell you is that uh, I have way too much forage in April and I don't have enough forage in August. And this graph really shows that out. And so we need to manage that summer portion uh, of the season. Now, that being said, one of the key grasses that we can utilize for summer management that causes us some animal health concerns is tall fescue. Uh, typically, tall fescue does a really nice job of growing in the dormant cool season months of July and August, and so we need to kind of manage for that. That's where a warm season grass may provide some benefit to that, like switchgrass, blue stem, um, but you'll find quickly if you do some research on a lot of these grasses, the productivity is a little bit less, uh, palatability can be an issue, um, and you have to have the ability to rest those. As you can see, that chart really trails off in autumn, so we need to be very conscious of our grazing strategies if we're going to incorporate a warm season grass. The other challenge becomes with them is establishment. Uh, we need to idle that land probably for a good 12, uh, maybe to 18 months the first year till we get that established. So that's a little bit of a challenge. The other thing we see is a forage legume. Uh, this can probably be the easier of the two if we're trying to manage that summer slump. So these are things like red clover in particular, as well as alfalfa. Alfalfa is probably one of the underutilized forage species that we can use. Uh, there may be some concern about bloat related to that, but I think if you accommodate your cattle to that, I think, and you understand the percent of alfalfa in your forage stand, you can kind of manage around that. So just kind of for reference, uh, there is a resource, uh, PM1792. This is selecting forage species. This is a really nice publication that you can use. This will go into a lot more detail um, as opposed to what I'm covering here today. There are several factors that you can use. And so this is kind of a pick and choose chart, if you will, to find things uh, that are rated good, fair, and poor for your specific situation. I would also encourage you when you find species on there that may look uh, like something you really want to encourage that maybe are not typical of your area, uh, that you contact an expert or another extension field agronomist to kind of walk through how that can fit your area in particular. So like I said, there's several tactics on this. Um, you can kind of use this as a chart for a beginning jumping off point, uh, especially if you're in the renovation phase. So selection characteristics or considerations that we want to look at, what do you want to, to, to accomplish? Um, and so for an example of this is if I was to tell people that I need a grass in southern Iowa that's going to grow under drought conditions, uh, it doesn't take a lot of fertility, it grows on extremely poor soils, and I need the ability to graze it uh, aggressively, I would tell people that species would be tall fescue. Now, obviously, most of us that have had experience with tall fescue will tell us that we have an endophyte problem. And so, yes, there are some animal health characteristics that may cause us some cattle health issues by grazing tall fescue. But if you want to look at the grass species itself in terms of what it can do for us, it's a very good tool. Now, that being said, if I was renovating a pasture, particularly in the northern part of the state, I would probably not recommend tall fescue as a desirable species. The one we're talking about is Kentucky 31. Uh, it contains an endophyte, essentially, that produces alkaloids uh, that the cattle will actually ingest. And so once they ingest that, then you can have some livestock productivity issues. Essentially what it does is it constricts the blood vessels of the animal so they have the inability to cool themselves uh, 
uh, without that endophyte. And so we have a little more heat stress with the, related to that. Uh, it can cause us some pregnancy issues with uh, cows. So that is probably the biggest concern that we have. In the advent of the newer generation, there's an endophyte free. So there are tall fescue varieties that do not contain the endophyte. The challenge in Iowa, I will tell you, is that typically they have lower productivity and they don't have the ability to withstand dry conditions that we have within the state of Iowa. The other option or a better alternative may be something called a novel endophyte tall fescue. So this tall fescue species variety contains a novel endophyte. So it still contains the endophyte, but it's less toxic to cattle in terms of that they ingest that. So we may see an opportunity where we would introduce or we would recommend a novel endophyte tall fescue depending on your specific farm. So Aaron mentioned that legumes are a, a good alternative or species to consider when we're looking at um, what forage species we might. The one thing I want to caution folks on if they are wanting to incorporate a legume, whether it's a total pasture renovation or we're looking at doing some interseeding, is the legumes can uh, provide some nitrogen by fixing nitrogen, but we need to make sure that the legumes that we're planting, uh, we have inoculation with that. So we have the right uh, rhizobium bacteria to ensure that we get good um, nodulation on those legumes. Uh, so we wanna make sure that, that we do have inoculation with that. And then the other thing we wanna be aware of is that that inoculum has not expired. Uh, so pay attention to that. And then if you do have seed or inoculum left over, um, we do wanna make sure that we store it in a cool place. I um, mean, also make sure that we use it before it gets expired as well. So, Aaron talked about a little bit about the different species we might want to think about. I want to talk a little bit more about actually getting those species in the ground and planted. So there's some different ways that we might incorporate new species into our forage stands. We might be totally starting over with a, a new seeding or doing a totally complete renovation to an existing stand. So there's different ways that we can actually get that seed planted. Um, in some cases, we may be looking at no-tilling that seed in we could also look at potentially broadcasting or drilling it into a tilled seed bed. Um, whether, no matter which way we end up seeding that, um, we wanna make sure that we have good site prep. And this usually needs to happen at least, or start happening at least a year before we wanna do that seeding. Uh, so we wanna make sure that we have address any potential soil fertility issues out there. Um, and we'll talk more about what those soil fertility issues might look like. We also wanna make sure that we have any of our problem weeds controlled before we establish a new stand. Um, and Aaron will talk more here in a little bit on weed management. And then if we are seeding where there was an existing stand, um, we wanna make sure that whatever was there has been killed before we go in and, and do a total new seeding there. Uh, we may also consider a companion crop. This isn't entirely necessary, um, but we may, especially if we're doing a spring seeding, may consider doing that. Um, oats are probably the most common companion crop that we that we see used. Um, and if we do wanna use oats as a companion crop, we're looking at seeding about a, a bushel to a bushel and a half per acre. I mean, where we might especially consider this is this, if we have like uh, an erosion concern, that can help as that new seeding is getting started. If we're doing a late summer seeding, we normally don't need to use a companion crop. Um, there might be a few exceptions, you know, if it's a, an erosion again is a big concern, but usually we don't see those companion crops used with the late summer seeding. And then once we get that new seeding planted, um, we want to make sure that we do manage it appropriately. And if we're going to do any grazing, uh, wait a little bit before we start that grazing to make sure that that new seeding is well established because um, we don't want to graze it too short or cause any issues where we're not going to have that the next year. Uh, Two other options for doing some seeding would be frost seeding or inner seeding. Uh, so frost seeding is probably one of the cheapest ways that we can do some renovations to an existing stand. Uh, so frost seeding is like it says, we're gonna go out there and basically broadcast that seed on the ground. Um, we typically recommend um, legumes like red clover tends to work really well with frost seeding. Uh, grasses, I shy away from a little bit just that they don't, they don't work as well from a frost seeding perspective. 
Um, and so we usually want to do this uh, late winter or early spring. We want it when the ground is still frozen um, and we don't want to put it on top of snow on the ground because if that snow were to melt, that seed could potentially move with it as well. And then basically we're just using that freeze thaw cycle to get in the spring rains to get that, that seed to soil contact that we want to get a good establishment there. Another option for doing uh, for pasture renovation or hayfield renovation is looking at actually doing some interseeding. Uh, so this is a way that we can introduce a different legume species or grass species into an existing stand using a no-till drill. Uh, so this option works really well if we have a really thin stand uh, to make sure that we get good seed to soil contact. Um, and then we also wanna make sure that we're not competing with the stand that is currently there as well. And typically from an interseeding perspective, we're looking at doing this um, either in the spring, so looking at kind of that mid-March to early May time frame. It depends a little bit year to year what the weather is, but that's the general window, window we look at doing this. Or we could do a late summer seeding, so looking at about mid-August to early September, and those dates might shift a little bit uh, depending upon if you're in southern Iowa versus northern Iowa. Uh, the one comment I will also make uh, with the late summer seeding is that we want to make sure that we do have good soil moisture. If it's really dry, we don't want to try and do interseeding at that point in time. And a benefit with the interseeding is that it, it is, it's a no-till drill, so there's relatively few field operations to introduce some new species to an, an existing stand. So next we'll talk a little bit about seeding timing. Uh, th this is really critical. I think, uh, as Rebecca pointed out, moisture and timing are probably the two most critical things that we deal with when we look at seeding or an establishment, especially related to the species that we have. So obviously we're talking about cool season grasses, yet they still need warmer soil temps to have good germination and good adequate growth early. The other thing that we see is that we get into the late summer seeding, we wanna make sure that we have moisture that that grass seed can germinate and grow enough, probably four to six inches, so it has adequate root system to survive the winter. Number, the one, number one failing that I see oftentimes is that we've either seeded too early in the spring where the grass germinated and cold temperatures, specifically frost, killed that seeding, or we see the same thing late in the summer. We seeded too late, maybe late September, first part of October, and we didn't have enough growth at that time. So this is really going to be the key. The other thing is, as Rebecca mentioned, seed to soil contact is a direct relation related to your survivability of your stand. So that's very, very important. Frost seeding occurs in March. I will tell you, you really kind of want to have your equipment lined up, your seed lined up, and have a tactic for when this happens. There is great opportunity in March, but oftentimes it's only maybe two, three, maybe four days. And so you have to look at what the forecasted weather is so that we can go out in there under dry conditions and run in with a no-till drill, make sure that the seed is covered, and then allow Mother Nature to take over from there with the frost uh, to basically give it good seed to soil contact from that point. There are several resources. Uh, we're gonna touch on a few of these. These are available through the ISU Extension Store or contact your local county extension office and they would be happy to get those. One is PM 1097. This talks about the topic we just visited with, interseeding and no-till pasture renovation. Um, this will give you a step-by-step -step guide to do that. PM 1792, this is selecting forage species, so you'll see a lot more forage species there than what we actually talked about here uh, today on this episode of Crops TV. The one that I think is really important as we look at when I talk about productivity is PM 17, or excuse me, 1971. This is how does a pasture plant grow? This is directly related to what type of productivity I can get from my grass to manage that. So we use the old adage, take half and leave half. And the reason for that is the root system or the root structure of a perennial grass plant is a direct correlation to the above ground growth. So this will give you a step-by-step -step guide on why it's important to not overgraze a pasture. The challenge I see is that we have the ability where we overgraze some pastures and this allows undesirable species to grow, whether that's weeds or maybe that's tall fescue if we don't want tall fescue as a part of our pasture management. 
The other one that I'll mention is PM of 1713. Uh, and this is an entire guide. This is a pasture management guide for livestock producers. So if you currently do not have a copy of that, I would recommend that you got a copy of this. Uh, this is actually more of a booklet. Um, and so this would allow you to kind of read through a lot of things related to pasture management and livestock production. Thanks. So we're gonna switch gears a little bit. We talked about the importance of species selection. Now we wanna talk about the importance of soil fertility management. I think this is one area that often gets overlooked, whether we're talking about pastures or uh, hay fields as well. And just like corn and soybeans, taking care of those soil fertility needs for our forage uh, plants is just as important. So when it comes to working on trying to maximize our forage productivity, we need to make sure that we are addressing those soil fertility needs. And so that starts with soil sampling and, and testing to see what are the soil fertility levels in our pastures or hay fields. I know oftentimes when I'm working with uh, producers and they're having issues and I ask, you know, when was the last time you soil sampled your pasture or your hay field? And they, they can't tell me the last time that they soil sampled. Uh, so do we wanna make sure that we are taking soil samples and testing, especially if we're gonna do any new seeding to address any soil fertility issues before we do that new seeding. Uh, so uh, the number of samples uh, we wanna take, um, it depends a little bit on how we're gonna go out there and collect those samples. Um, we could use a grid, which we often will use in like our row crops, um, or we can maybe look at zone management samples. So kind of looking at the soil types and maybe how those pastures or hay fields have been managed, or if we have different paddocks, uh, making sure that we're getting good representative soil samples. And we still probably don't want a single sample to represent more than you know 10 acres, 15 acres at the most, because we want to make sure that we are capturing that variability when we're collecting those samples. Um, but I also understand if folks don't want to do a two and a half acre grid on their pasture or their forages as well. As far as the number of cores we want to collect per sample, it's just like we would for corn or soybeans, where we want at least 10 to 15 cores that are going to make up that composite soil sample. And from a depth, the depth perspective of soil sampling, we're still looking at a six inch depth, especially for P and K. We may look at a shallower samplers samples if we're wanting to get a better handle on the pH in our in our forage areas. And then when we're collecting those samples, you know, if we have any high traffic areas um, or areas where we physically cannot get um, fertilizer spread, we want to avoid sampling those areas because they might skew those results a little bit. And then uh, we want to make sure that those samples are being sent to a certified soil testing lab. And there's a link there on the screen that you can go to see uh, what are the certified soil testing labs here in Iowa. And that is found on the IDLS uh, Pesticide Bureau's website. So once we get our, or take those samples, get them sent off and get those samples back as far as what the results are, we need to understand and make sense of those results. And so one handy resource we use uh, is PM1688, a general guide for crop nutrient and limestone recommendations in Iowa. And this is another resource that is available through the ISU Extension store. And this is a nice publication uh, that you can either download on your computer or you can, um, you can print it off or you can buy a, a purchase a, a printed booklet of it. Um, but it has different tables um, depending upon the crop or the forage or pasture type that we're looking at. And so it considers the soil test level. Are we low, very low, um, optimum high or very high, um, which those categories tell us the odds of seeing a return on that fertilizer investment. And then it also has a nice table too, where we can account for crop nutrient removal, which just is especially important if we are harvesting those forages, so taking any off as hay. So these are just two examples of the tables that are included in that publication PM1688. Um, the one table is our recommendations for alfalfa or an alfalfa grass uh, mix, and then the other table is a more cool season. So you can see that those tables do vary a little bit on their recommendations depending upon the species that we're looking at. So we wanna make sure that we are looking at the right table for whatever species we have. And I have highlighted there the optimum category, which that is typically just based off of what our crop removal would be. So we wanna make sure that we do read those footnotes to see um, you know, uh, what the, 
the calculations were done for crop removal. And if your crop removal is a little bit different, we might need to make some adjustments there. But you can again see how the, the recommendations vary a little bit uh, depending upon the species that we're using. So again, we wanna make sure we have the right table for the species that, we're, that we have in our, in our field. Uh, and so with the, the soil fertility and understanding that um, our requirements are going to be a little bit different depending upon if we're haying that field or if we're, we're using it from a pasture perspective. Um, so usually with pasture, we've got the, the cattle out there grazing and they're going to have their manure out there and the, that those nutrients that they're they're feeding on, they're going to get returned to the soil, but not 100% of them. So we assume about 75 to 95% of the P and K will get returned to the soil. Um, but we want to think about the distribution that it's getting returned to the soil. Um, so it might not be evenly distributed. And so we might need to um, fix or even out that with some uh, fertilizer that we put on. And then from a hay perspective, um, and this is really important, even if you know most of the time that field's in pasture, but maybe as Aaron mentioned earlier, we're gonna take that first uh, little bit, we're gonna hay it early in the spring when maybe there's more grass and we can keep ahead of on pasture. And so we really wanna make sure that we are accounting for how much we're removing when we take that off. And so uh, this is just a table looking at um, alfalfa. I've got uh, other grass species included there as well. And then how much um, P205 and K2O are we removing per ton? So just for example there, as we look at that table, we see with alfalfa or an alfalfa grass mix, we remove 13 pounds of P205 per ton and 43 uh, pounds of K2O per ton. I think people often underestimate the amount of potassium that they remove. And so it's not uncommon to see lower potassium levels, um, especially where we've taken a lot of hay. And so if, if we have those low levels, that can definitely have a big impact on the productivity or maybe lack of productivity that we're seeing in our forage stands. So next I wanna talk a little bit about soil pH. Uh, this is something oftentimes I don't think we think about when we look at forage and pasture production in particular. And so this can really begin to address on what species that I have in my pasture. Typically in most pastures in Iowa, we are probably going to be on the acidic side. And unless you're in the north central part of Iowa, maybe you have some lower landscape pastures uh, that are prone to flooding. Maybe they may be a little bit calcareous, uh, but as a general rule, most pastures are going to be acidic in Iowa. And so the chart that we're looking at can talk a little bit about the availability of the nutrients. And so when we talk about nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium, those are the real key ones that we wanna look at uh, in particular into pasture growth. So you'll see some lines on the chart there. Um, the first one that I will point out, obviously seven is neutral. And then the next line that we see is pink in color. Uh, that is 6.8. So if you uh, were to visit with me and you said, I wanna incorporate legumes into my pasture, specifically alfalfa, then I would indicate that we really wanna to try to move that pH to a 6.8 level. And the reason is, is that if I'm going to go to the effort to establish alfalfa, I have to give it a proper environment for it to survive. And so to intercede alfalfa into a pasture that has a soil pH, say less than six, is gonna be extremely difficult for it to survive. The other thing that you'll quickly notice is if I have pastures that are extremely acidic in that five to 5.5 range, you can see my phosphorus is not real available. So that is one quick way that I could begin to address applying lime. And as I applied lime to that pasture, I would begin to make that phosphorus more available. Especially if I'm haying that pasture, that is probably the number one uh, question that I would ask producers is what is your pasture or forage management uh, in that particular situation. So this is a chart uh, from PM 1688. This is table 16. And so this will give you the ability to make your own recommendations on lime that you would want to apply. And so how you follow this chart is on the left-hand side of that chart, that's the buffer pH. And this actually indication will come from your soil test. So there'll be two pH numbers on a soil test when you get this back from the laboratory. One will be the buffer pH, the other will be actual soil pH. For this exercise, we're going to use the buffer pH. And that is what I want to use when I determine how much lime that I have. So you can see by the red arrow in this example, we would want to lime to the three inch depth for a pasture. 
and let's just hypothetically say that our buffer pH was 6.7, and so that would tell us that we would need roughly 700 pounds if we were to correct that for a pH of 6.5. Other thing I'll talk briefly before I get to this slide is there's oftentimes a couple different forms of lime that are available. Um, so there's pelleted lime, which can be used on a pasture, um, and there's also ag lime. And so the key difference between these two that I tell people it has to do with uh, longevity of the property or maybe what your lease is. So if it's a farm that you own, I would tell people ag lime can be a good opportunity because it will take longer to break down because technically it is less pure than pelleted lime. Pelleted lime typically is a 95 to 98% pure product, but the downside to that is, is that your pH benefit lasts a lot less with pelleted lime. So if it's a lease situation and you have a short lease, then pelleted lime may or may not be an option for you. Uh, if it's a owned property, um, something like ag lime can work as well. So. Next, we're gonna talk a little bit about nitrogen. And this is probably the most important thing related to pasture management in terms of that we see immediately in terms of growth. And so we really have to determine what that cost is. And so this is gonna be a cost to return benefit or a cost to return ratio, if you will. Uh, we know that applying nitrogen to grass gives us increased productivity, but we have to ask ourselves if a little is good is a lot better that's gonna depend a little bit on your management style. I ask people, can you use all the grass that the nitrogen will produce? Oftentimes we're talking about cool season grasses. So if we apply high rates of nitrogen in the early spring of the year, when that grass is naturally growing at a rapid rate, do I have enough cows to graze that? Or is it simply going to mature seed out in terms of a seed head, and I will not get that productivity. So this is kind of a catch-22 situation. The other thing we need to understand is that high nitrogen rates can affect the amount of endophyte that is produced in tall fescue. So key questions to ask yourself about your pasture is, do I have fescue? And how much nitrogen would I like to apply? And can I basically harvest that in the spring? For those producers that harvest or hay a pasture initially, then a little higher nitrogen management rate was probably going to be beneficial. If you're simply applying nitrogen to get that green grass look, and we're hauling cows maybe later in the year, mid-May to late May, depending on your management style or your calving schedule, um, we might not be able to use that nitrogen and maybe a June nitrogen application at a lower rate ahead of a rainfall might be a little bit better. Typically for most people, if given the choice and you have the ability to do that, a split application of nitrogen for a grass pasture is probably going to be more beneficial in a grazing situation. Also, I'll talk briefly about forms of nitrogen. Uh, ammonium sulfate, not ammonium nitrate, uh, is a great option when it is available for producers to use. Most often in Iowa, I would say urea is probably used quite frequently. So how do we talk a little bit about that? Um, do I have a legume? This is also a really good question that you need to ask yourself. If you have one greater than one third of your pasture is a legume, say that's a red clover or an alfalfa, you probably don't need a lot of additional nitrogen. If it's less than a third, I would try to treat that pretty much like a typical grass pasture. And so you're going to have to get a good idea of what this is. You can do that in a variety of ways. You can just walk your pasture or ride it with a four-wheeler and just get a sense for yourself. Um, or you can actually use a ruler and a measuring stick and kind of go out and look at some estimates and try to figure out what that is. So. The key question becomes, how much nitrogen do I need to apply? All right, and you'll get a lot of different variants or different opinions on what this needs to be. Um, so I will preface this by saying pastures in Southern Iowa, we wanna talk a little bit about how much can I utilize, okay? I have already talked briefly about split applying that, but as a general rule, I would tell you somewhere between 60 pounds, if it's a pasture, if you're going to hay it, then I would err on the higher side, 
but for most cool season, 100 to 120 would be the maximum amount of nitrogen that I would apply. And I would caveat that by saying I would prefer that that was in two applications as opposed to one. And so that is going to be the challenge as a producer that you'll need to kind of sort out. It depends a little on the species, like I indicated, whether you have fescue in there. Um, if you have true cool seasons, which these would be things like orchard grass and timothy, they will grow extremely rapidly early in the spring in the March and April timeframe, maybe the first week of May. But if you're in Southern Iowa, the grasses that are gonna grow predominantly in June and later in the season will be things like brome grass, dependent on rainfall, and tall fescue and Kentucky bluegrass. Warm season grasses, if you've established those into your pasture, obviously this is going to be a mid to late spring. This will probably be more like a May, late May, early June. Um, they probably respond a little better to more nitrogen management at that point because you're trying to manage productivity and they will probably be a little less productive than a cool season grass, uh, but those can also be an option. P and K management, uh, this can basically be applied anytime. Once you have an accurate soil test, uh, a fall application can be uh, very beneficial or an early spring application. Uh, we just wanna be a little sensitive uh, to phosphorus and potash applied to frozen soils. As I talked about before, um, the reason we wanna be careful of nitrogen rates on tall fescue is because of the endophyte. And so you can actually make this problem worse by overmanaging, And so we want to be extremely sensitive to that. The other thing is, is if you have tall fescue pastures, be sensitive using poultry manure, as this can also increase the amount of uh, endophyte that it's expressed in the tall fescue. So we may have heard about things in terms of special nitrogen. And so these are things that can be definitely utilized in a pasture type situation. So there's a coated urea or a PCU. This is a polymer coat that coats the urea peril before it's applied. And so we're guessing at that point on what the environmental conditions will be to break down that polymer coat. There's sulfur coated urea serves kind of the same purpose as poly-coated urea, uh, in other that it uses sulfur to coat that urea peril as opposed to a polymer. Uh, there are other things, NBPT. Uh, this is also something that can be used. Uh, Agritain is a brand name uh, that you can buy. Uh, there's other options that are out there. Uh, the other is a nitrification inhibitor or urease inhibitor. Um, these can be highly beneficial if you're utilizing urea as your sole nitrogen source. Uh, and then the one that we don't talk very much about um, is a nitrification inhibitor. You may have heard of this as a INSERV or INSTINCT. Uh, these can be used in liquid forms of nitrogen. Um, well, there's not a lot of anhydrous obviously used uh, in pastures, which uh, would work, but I don't know the topography that that would work the best in. So I get this question oftentimes, and so we're just looking at a chart here basically, and so should I use coated urea? And I'll just cut to the chase, and the answer to that for most pastures, uh, I would say is yes. And the reason is, is we don't have the ability to accurately predict uh, a one inch rainfall after we spread our pasture. Now, obviously if we have our own spreader uh, and we have it loaded and we can look to the weather uh, in the sky and decide, yes, I know that I'm going to get rainfall, um, then I can uh, skip or not use a coated urea. But what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to buy time. Uh, for most pastures, I don't have the ability to incorporate that urea or get it covered from a surface application. And so what you're seeing on the chart here is uh, the days after application that I'm going to basically lose some of my nitrogen. And so that's why it's important to use a coated product if available. What form is best? Um, there are several different forms, but as I indicated earlier, urea is probably the number one form that's used in Iowa. Uh, what you'll see on this chart, this is the amount of loss of nitrogen. Uh, the one that I prefer the most, but you also have to check in terms of cost, uh, ammonium sulfate. Ammonium sulfate is probably gonna be the best choice when available and cost effective in terms of applying to a grass pasture in a surface application where we're not incorporating it, we're simply laying it on top of the surface. And you can see the reason for that uh, comment is basically gonna be the amount of nitrogen uh, that's lost. The other one that you see there is a coated urea um, or an inhibitor, and you can see that that also can be beneficial uh, when applying urea.
Next, we'll talk about uh, proper forage management. We've indicated that. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about pest management, and this, uh, for practical purposes, is weed management. And, and so how do I manage weeds in my pasture? And so uh, oftentimes I get several uh, photographs each year when I look at pastures and, and what weed is this and how do I control that? Um, but we need to ask ourselves, why do we have weeds in a pasture? And the simple answer to that is oftentimes we maybe have overgrazed um, just because of mother nature. Uh, maybe that stand is a little bit thin. Uh, poor soil fertility is also another key factor that we have related to weed management. So typically the weeds that we experience uh, in most pastures, I like to lump them into the three groups that we have. So there's annual weeds, uh, and I will tell you that annual weeds will probably be a pasture for mo or problem in pastures for most producers every year. We need to understand that they're annual weeds, so they have a specific life cycle that they're trying to complete. So I'll have some of these weeds early in the year, and when I get to August, when my pasture is extremely thin, I'm still probably going to have some annual weeds. The other one is biennials. I can think of several thistle species that are biennials. And so we need to try to find those in the previous year when they're in the rosette stage uh, and look at control measures that can help us with that. And then the uh, hypothetical one is perennial. And so this is the Canada thistle that we like to all uh, complain about in most of our pastures that for most producers are a battle uh, every single year. So there's also poisonous weeds. And so we need to look at some of those uh, things like nightshade, jimson weed, uh, pokeweed, poison hemlock uh, on occasion. So typically these are more of a problem uh, depending on the species in your pasture. Maybe it's sheep or horses. Uh, they may be more sensitive to these species uh, than cattle in particular, although cattle, uh, if that's all that's left to graze, uh, they may cause us an issue as well. So how do we control uh, weeds? There's cultural methods. Uh, mowing, I think, is probably one that's underutilized in some situations, uh, but that's also a timing scenario. Uh, for example, we don't want to be mowing Canada thistle in September um, and have all that fuzzy cotton blowing around in the wind, uh, so we're simply spreading it. We wanna be able to mow that earlier in the season uh, when it's in the lot smaller pre-bud stage or pre-flower stage. Uh, and then the other opportunity is late in the fall because it's a perennial. Uh, if we can do mowing late in the season, uh, it will have less root reserves. Um, and so we can actually do some type of control there. Uh, in particular, chemical is probably the number one use that we can use. Uh, there is a several uh, host of products that are available for pasture control uh, that, to be real frank, they do an excellent job uh, when we have the ability to use a sprayer uh, in the field. And so these are really good tools uh, that we can use. Uh, there are several uh, classes of chemistry. Visit with your local ag retailer or your extension agronomist, uh, and we can steer you in the right direction of products that you could apply. For the most part, most weeds and pastures can be controlled with a herbicide available today. And one other pest we want to talk a little bit about, well, weeds are probably our most common pests that we deal with um, in pastures or forages. Uh, we do want to touch briefly on uh, fall armyworms. Um, I know this was a, a big issue that a lot of producers dealt with this past fall. Um, and while we don't need to worry about them overwintering uh, here and causing issues next spring, um, I do just want folks to be mindful about the damage that they maybe did this fall and some of the potential concerns that we have regarding those stands as we go into next spring. Uh, so the pictures on the screen here, we can see what those army worms look like. I um, mean, it was not uncommon where we had, you know, a totally fine, you know, forage stand and then it was gone. I um, mean, thankfully, if we did give it uh, some time, we did see some decent regrowth uh, this last fall, but we still worry about winter injury or winter kill. Um, so a lot of times, you know, if it was in October and those, those stands with alpha, because of the alfalfa, or excuse me, because of the um, army worms were chewed back really far. Uh, we wanna make sure that uh, we had some good regrowth. And even if we had some regrowth, we still worry about that winter injury. Uh, so we can see winter injury and winter kill, um, either because of a lack of snow cover, or if we get really cold temperatures, or if we have you know warm spells in the middle of winter, um, or if plants are submerged in frozen or ponded water or in low-lying areas. 
or if we maybe took a later cutting and we didn't quite have those reserves available in the roots uh, like we'd like. And that later cutting this past year could kind of relate back to maybe some of the injury we had with those army worms. Uh, so uh, the plants that maybe have some winter injury, uh, they may still survive, but those plants usually are slower to green up uh, in, this, in this spring, so we don't want to make any quick decisions. And so when we're evaluating our stands here this upcoming spring, we want to think about the number of plants we're seeing per square foot and also take into consideration the age of the stand. Um, so usually we want to go out and evaluate those stands in the spring when we've got about three to four inches of regrowth uh, in the spring. And so uh, from a legume perspective, um, we wanna count the number of, of plants that we're seeing uh, per square foot. And we wanna do this randomly throughout the field. Uh, usually we wanna take a count about once every five to 10 acres. And then in addition to taking up the counts, um, I also wanna dig up plants when I'm evaluating that. And I wanna look for new regrowth and then also look to see if I see any um, root rot as well. And so the table up here uh, is kind of summarizing, you know, what we'd want, want to see for plants per square foot while also considering the age of the stand. Uh, so it's broken out, you know, if, we, if it's a newer seating or if it's, you know, a stand that's been around for three, four plus years, you know, how many, how many plants we'd want per square foot and we've got it broken down into, you know, good, uh, marginal, or if it's less, uh, if it's in that consider reseeding category there. Um, then we'd want to consider maybe doing some frost seeding or interseeding, depending on, on going forward there. And here's some pictures of when we want to dig up those plants, um, and especially in alfalfa, you know, splitting those crowns and looking to see uh, if we have any crown rot going on. You know, we'd want to see that top picture there where we've got a lot more nice, white, healthy tissue compared to that bottom picture there where we see a lot of discolored uh, brown, orangish looking tissue there. That plant's going to be impacted by the ability to take up nutrients and water. You know, it might live, but it, it's not going to be as productive and it probably will eventually die out there. Uh, for our grasses, we can see um, some winter injury, or maybe some winter kill with grasses, but most of our forage grasses are going to survive a lot better than the legumes. Um, orchard grass and ryegrass are going to be the most susceptible to winter injury. So we want to make sure that we're getting some regrowth on those grasses, but uh, usually it's the legumes that we worry the most about from a winter injury perspective. So how do we manage if we if we see a lot of winter injury out there? Um, so, you know, one option is, you know, if we have a, a decent stand, uh, but they're slower to grow up, we might think about maybe harvesting a little bit later. Um, if we're dairy, this might be a little bit harder to do since we want, we're managing more for quality. Um, but if we're on the beef side of things and it's more quantity versus quality, we might push, consider pushing that back to give those plants a little bit more time to recover. Uh, we might also uh, raise the cutting height, uh, so not cut as low. So that way, again, we're not taking as much from the roots for that regrowth. Um, we're giving it some a boost there because we've got some leaf tissue left there. Uh, we also want to make sure that we have uh, are addressing any soil fertility issues. So uh, making sure we have good fertilizer out there and then also paying attention to any potential insect concerns, um, especially like alfalfa weevil or potato leaf hoppers in the spring. And then if we need to, to reestablish or do some uh, reseeding, you know, we often get asked, you know, what species. Um, if we have alfalfa and it's past the seeding year, we don't want to reseed alfalfa back into that alfalfa. It's just not going to work. Um, so then we're looking at maybe doing uh, red clover or potentially incorporating some grasses to thicken up that alfalfa stand. And we, um, if, we're, if we're definitely needing uh, forage, we might want to kind of have a plan B to have some supplemental forage available if our forage stand isn't quite as productive as we want it to because of winter kill or winter injury. And so to kind of wrap things up here, um, just recapping everything that Aaron and I talked here today, um, in order to have really productive uh, forage stands, management is really key. Um, and that especially comes back to thinking about, you know, what species we have planted out there, uh, making sure that we are addressing soil fertility and also pest management, especially from a weed management perspective. Yes, I just want to thank everybody for uh, today's episode. And if you have specific questions related to forage production and management, uh, feel free to contact Rebecca Vitito, uh, myself, Aaron Soikling, or your local extension field agronomist. And we would be glad to walk with you about your specific forage and pasture management issues. Mm -hmm.